This talk is about biomarkers and specifically about three, um, three approaches that we're taking here uh, at the Ivy Center. And, um, and the main overview, uh, over, the concept is that, you know, we're doing so many things uh, but we, in terms of treatment of this disease, but we really need to know what we're going after and how to measure these things. So it's the hope that this, uh, these things will help. And some of this has already been talked about today. That's why I may go over some of these fairly quickly. Um, but practically speaking right now in terms of, quote, biomarkers, what do we have that is helpful in glioblastoma treatment or predicting treatment? And there are really only two things that I think, practically speaking, we use day in, day out, and that's MGMT methylation status and IDH1 mutation status. Neither of these which will necessarily determine who gets what kind of therapy, but more um, they are relevant to how we can tell patients they might do overall uh, based on standard treatment. Um, the three approaches that I'm going to discuss are anatomical architecture, which Dr. Uh, Pachowski, Ralph Pachowski spoke about a little bit earlier, um, some of the work we're doing with uh, uh, blood-based biomarkers, and then some work on CMV, which will uh, um, which will complement what Duane has just spoken about. So when pathologists look at these tumors, they say, this is a glioblastoma. They're cells with nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio changes, and there's pseudopalisading and areas of necrosis. Uh, but it wasn't really, I don't believe, until um, some of the work that was done here with the Allen Institute um, and doing laser capture microdissection that uh, the expression of specific biomarker gene products in certain areas of these tumors has been more carefully elucidated. Um, and this is sort of an overview of what the state of the uh, thinking was until about you know, five years ago, uh, which is that basically we know that there are some neural stem cells that may give a rise to neuroglioprogenitor cells, but we don't know if astrocytes or oligodendrocytes actually go in this direction either. But in any event, something probably uh, leads to the development of tumor-initiating cells and then and these cells may be divided in general into two different uh, phenotypes, we think now, um, based on uh, IDH1 mutation and the new molecular classification, we think that something happens perhaps in the younger population and the more, um, um, the, the more benign, quote unquote, tumors, they have an IDH1 mutation and then they sort of segregate to one class of tumors. Uh, those with wild type uh, IDH1 and other things like TERT mutations um, uh, go in this direction, and then uh, previous to the last few years would be considered uh, any one of three uh, or four classifications classical, mesenchymal, uh, neuronal, glioblastoma. And these are associated with certain markers, EGFR, NF1, all these things you've heard about. but. Practice, practically speaking, these have not really guided our treatment or allowed us to prognosticate very well in terms of what uh, patients should expect. So um, what I'm hoping, and I will not go too much in detail into what Ralph already talked about, but what I'm hoping is that the molecular classification based on tumor architecture will allow us to have some more insight into uh, as new therapies develop, how these therapies might actually uh, interact with a patient's tumor. And the reason I mention this is because if you, for instance, consider a convection-enhanced delivery or just a, uh, a IV drug, where that drug goes in the brain may be determined by the vascular permeability of the tumor and the leaky blood vessels related to different tumor components. And it's going to be important to know that if you're giving a drug that, um, that penetrates um, only, I mean, it penetrates everywhere, but um, maybe has a certain characteristic that doesn't penetrate in a certain microenvironment, that it might not get to certain areas of the tumor. So I'm hoping that the work done by Ralph and the Allen Brain Institute uh, and the group of our, in our lab will help determine that. And that's um, based on the work showing that anatomical features, if you cut these out and do RNA-seq, you can then get um, uh, transcription heat maps that will tell you which types of gene products are expressed, and then this has been confirmed 
uh, using in situ hybridization of these areas to confirm the gene expression of certain genes. Um, and then, for instance, if you're looking at the VEGFA expression in an area of pseudopalisading area near necrosis, which is shown here, this would be all necrotic region, these are the pseudopalisading cells, you see that the VEGF is expressed in a very discrete population of um, cells. So what we're hoping is that this database will help guide people in the future with therapies. For instance, if you have a, uh, for how Avastin might work, Avastin would be um, an important molecule in terms of blocking VEGF in this area, but um, you know it may not be as important in other areas of the tumor that are not highly expressing VEGF, and that may uh, allow us to sort of uh, inform our um, understanding of how these various drugs and therapies might work. Um, I think that the take-home point from these studies is that uh, variations in the expression of the tumors of gene products is related to, as Ralph said, the different areas of the tumor, for instance, leading, a leading edge of tumor, cellular tumor, microvascular proliferation, which is really a distinct entity. Um, it's really a vascular type of uh, gene expression pattern. Um, and, uh, and, and also, in, in sort of in reverse, if we're looking for therapies to attack the most uh, recalcitrant parts of the tumor, like the uh, pseudopalisading areas near hypoxic areas, you know, it'll, it's interest, it'll be good to help us know what genes are highly expressed in those areas to know that that might be a, a vulnerable uh, area to, um, to uh, attack the tumor or vulnerable gene to attack. For instance, VEGF here is shown to be 53 times, 53-fold higher expressed in these areas, as you can see from that previous uh, slide I showed. So um, we know that these areas are hard to get to because they're near hypoxic regions with perhaps low, 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 area, low amounts of uh, oxygen and blood flow. Um, but if you know the sort of the um, critical gene products that are expressed there, maybe that can inform our ability to design therapies that target and knock out genes that are critical for these invasive areas or these areas of low oxygen tension. Um, and this is just uh, basically um, confirmed and sort of re-established re, um, by taking different areas of uh, tumor um, architecture and looking at the gene expression patterns and just showing again that each of these different areas uh, has a different gene expression pattern, especially microvascular proliferation, which is, as I mentioned, is almost a distinct different um, biology completely than the rest of the tumor, where these uh, abnormally growing blood vessels have their own sort of uh, biology. And so understanding what's, what's going on in these different compartments may allow us to say, look, if we want to do a truly potent anti-angiogenic therapy, let's focus on uh, the biology of this area, and, and that will inform that biology. Um, and again, if you take um, any given tumor and, you, and you're interested in where is a gene expressed, you can use this database to say, okay, I'm, I'm interested in this, um, in this gene, TREM1, where is this expressed? Well, you're going to find that it's not expressed in the cellular or invasive or leading edge or microvascular um, proliferation area, but almost solely in the area of pseudopalisading area near necrosis. So um, I think that this will hopefully um, continue to be a uh, valuable resource for investigators around the world and pharmaceutical companies who are looking for strategies to target the tumor, not in just a blunt hammer, a sledgehammer um, approach, but with a more elegant uh, approach designed to hit vulnerable areas of the tumor. The next um, thing I'm going to talk about is uh, work that was primarily done uh, by uh, a person in our laboratory, Dr. Ghosh, who has uh, who completed his postdoc at um, Institute for Systems Biology with Dr. Hood, um, and he, they used a systems approach to sort of uh, design how you would figure out what biomarkers might be uh, specific to patients with glioblastoma. And this is an evolving work, and we haven't made a huge amount of progress since I discussed this last year, but we are um, continually collecting blood specimens and getting more and more information uh, that I think will 
continue to move this forward to something that can be clinically relevant. So basically, um, Dr. Hood and, and, uh, and um, Demon in the lab said, you know, let's suppose or hypothesize that tumor cells can have cell surface proteins that break off and get into the bloodstream and can be detected. So if we hypothesize that, we should be able to go uh, take all the genes we know and pick the ones that are on the cell surface of the protein or secreted, I mean cell surface of the cell or that are secreted. And then let's look at the databases for glioblastoma, the two available, available big databases, TCGA and Rembrandt, and see which one of those are highly expressed in glioblastoma. And then let's do a um, sort of computer analysis and hypothesize which one of those you might look for if you were looking for proteins that would be in the, in the bloodstream of these patients. So they did that, and then they came up with um, proteins that might be produced in the tumors that might get into the bloodstream with the concept of uh, figuring out a panel and then validating it. And so they started looking at tumor cell lines, comparing them to normal cells and normal stem cells, and they coated the surface of the cells with biotin. They pulled off all these proteins, and then they found out which ones actually were uh, expressed differentially between the tumor cells and the normal cells, and then they went back to the databases and confirmed that these were actually high, more highly expressed in glioblastomas than in normal brain. And they took that information, and then they um, went back to, uh, to the data sets to see, you know, if you pick the ones that um, are the most highly expressed, will they show uh, specificity to tumor versus normal? And several of these proteins uh, that they had picked had a very high specificity rate in tumor uh, versus um, normal. And this is the sensitivity going on this direction. So then they picked ones in this high sensitivity and specificity uh, tri uh, quadrant and um, went back to uh, tissues of glioblastoma patients versus controls and found out that these were actually able to, if you did mass spectroscopy or spectrometry of the tumors, they were able to sort of parse out and divide tumor versus normal using um, mass spec. And then when they did the um, same thing with blood from glioblastoma patients or the plasma versus plasma from normal patients, they also found that these proteins that had been hypothesized to, to be likely to be secreted into the bloodstream based on a glioblastoma, they actually were able to segregate away from healthy controls. So after working in this area for a while, they, uh, we came up with a list of 33 proteins that were predicted to be highly uh, specific and sensitive for glioblastoma patients in terms of what might be found in their blood versus controls. Um, and so they, um, we tested uh, groups of 20 patients and matched controls from four different um, blood supplies from different areas in the country independently. And we found that several of these proteins from the bloods of these patients would cluster and distinguish um, the healthy uh, patients in a blinded fashion from patients who had glioblastoma. For instance, you can see the GBM patients had lower levels of this protein than this one, uh, whereas in this case it was similar, and then in this case the, there was a generally higher um, concentration of that protein than others. So of these proteins that uh, seem to discriminate healthy versus controls. Um, we went back and uh, looked at um, these different sources to find the ones that were consistently able to parse out. Um, and then we started doing experiments here, looking at some of them before tumor resection and after a complete tumor resection to see if the levels of some of these would reflect the uh, tumor volume or the bulk of the tumor that might be quantitative. And we found, for instance, this marker here seem to have higher levels pre-op than 10 days post-op, whereas this one was lower pre-op and higher post-op. Um, so these are still preliminary studies, but this is just an example of one blood marker that we're interested in that was uh, followed in patients pre-operatively and post-operatively for two or three days post-op, and then at the day of the patient coming back around 10 days post-op. And in all of these cases um, that we did, you know, kind of 
we had a, um, a neuroradiologist get tumor volume, so we tried to correlate tumor volume with blood level. And for this particular protein, we found almost in every case, pre and post operatively, that the, uh, the um, level of this biomarker started going down at day 10 post op, except for this case. So I was like wondering what was, what was the deal with that case? And it turned out that this was a glioblastoma that was right in the motor cortex, and all I could do was biopsy it. And it had actually, you know, probably stirred up uh, an inflammatory reaction from the biopsy, but no tumor had been debulked. So, um, so that was kind of interesting. It was the only one that was not resected. So we've got a lot more work to do in this, and we plan to expand our analysis uh, from um, more targets and narrow it down to come up with a panel that can hopefully be used to follow the um, blood levels of patients with glioblastoma. And um, we've, uh, we're applying for a grant that will allow us to prospectively acquire bloods and then retrospectively after we've lock made a lockdown panel, go back and analyze the, these and see if our um, blood biomarkers would allow us to predict the tumor recurrence in PFS and OS uh, based on um, previously collected clinical data. And uh, the last of the three things that I'll talk about in terms of biomarkers, uh, I got a beautiful introduction, uh, so I don't have to say too much, but I think I'm going to see if Dwayne will actually give me his slides so I can use those next time I give a talk. You did a great job of explaining this. but um, So he's already discussed uh, uh, human cytomegalovirus, um, and it's just an unbelievably complicated virus, but um, I think one of the things I think about is this virus has been around for probably several million years, and almost every species of uh, animal has its own specific CMV going down to snails. So this thing has been involved in our evolution and coevolution, and it's probably figured out every mechanism to turn on or off any, um, any important genes. And I believe that this virus may be an innocent bystander when a tumor cell starts, but it may find this to be a very hospitable environment, and it, uh, by getting activated, may promote the biology. And regardless of what is going on, if it's actually there and, and required for the tumor or present, if it can be targeted immunologically, um, then it may serve as a great uh, biomarker for uh, immunotherapy, as Dwayne mentioned. And I have to say, you know, the data that you've presented Every time I see that, I think I'm not aware of any um, better survival data for glioblastoma than those two small studies you presented. But um, if you know of any, I'd be interested to, know, to see. But he already showed some of the early studies we did when we did immunostaining for glioblastoma, showing various viral proteins were present in the tumors, but not in normal brain. Um, and um, then we did in situ hybridization with RNA and DNA probes and appropriate controls and found uh, these were pr present. And so the question is, so, so what? Well, as he mentioned, uh, my colleague in Karolinska has shown uh, a negative study, but then did a retrospective analysis, which has problems, obviously, and published it as a little letter to the New England Journal. But she now has collected um, further data on valgan cyclovir and glioblastoma that seems to that is pretty striking, and um, is, she's in the process of trying to publish this. And, you know, with the new information about the fact that radiation can reactivate systemic viral um, uh, viremia, I think that this is extremely uh, important because um, we know that in just anyone who's a, a patient in the hospital, if they're an ICU patient and they have viremia from CMV, even from a broken leg, that that increases their mortality by 100%. So something about just having the virus uh, reactivated, and especially if it's causing an previously undiagnosed encephalitis, I think it's very important. So maybe that's what is going on here, or maybe it's directly interfering with the virus, and that's decreasing the tumor biology. Uh, and this is just uh, the data from Duane's uh, paper in Nature that I was just going to reiterate, showing this amazing survival data and the other follow-up paper that he just showed. So. Um, Briefly, what, what's, the, what's the mechanism or what do we think is going on? And I think to the best of my abilities to understand what I suspect is going on, 
I refer to a really great article in uh, Cell Host and Microbe, and it talks about DNA viruses that cause cancer or are associated with cancer. And if you look at something like Epstein-Barr virus or herpes simplex virus or um, human Kaposi sarcoma virus, which is called herpes vi human herpes virus 8, these viruses are evolutionarily, um, you know, very long-standing viruses. They get in to people and they live for and they stay there for your whole life. And typically, they want to be under the radar. So, Kaposi sarcoma virus is a, a virus that causes cancer only in the setting of profound immunosuppression in AIDS patients. But um, when it infects certain cells, it probably produces a, a, a pattern of gene products. And if that cell is detected by the immune system, it's killed. So it probably goes into a latent state and expresses only a low level of certain proteins that are under the radar. However, if that cell is stimulated by inflammation and lack of a T cell immune response, the virus will, it can enter what's called an abortive lytic infection where it starts to produce all these viral proteins, but it's not actually producing virus. Um, and, in, and this is the same thing with Epstein-Barr virus. And in those situations when there's an abortive lytic pattern of expression, uh, we're all familiar with the 10 hallmarks of cancer, these viral proteins start getting expressed, which drive all of these pathways. And in the setting of inflammation and immunosuppression, that can activate both um, neoplasia of the tumor cell itself and then um, neoplasia almost like pattern of the cells around it by production of cytokines, uh, inflammatory, and growth factor products. Uh, so if you take a person with AIDS and Kaposi sarcoma, that cancer will go away if you can correct their immune deficiency. So it's a conditional cancer. And I think that um, my feelings about CMV may be somewhere along the same lines, but not only conditional, but I think it may be cell dependent and the cell of most impact or import, import or importance may be the, the tumor stem cell. And as Dwayne mentioned, we started studying these neurospheres where we grow our glioblastoma cells and culture in these conditions that allow stem cell survival. And Nestin is sort of the prototypical marker, uh, sorry, shown here in red, of a, a neural stem, glial stem cell. And we found that the, there was a strong correlation with IE1 expression, which is the driver of the CMV genome, um, the viral IE1. And, and this was interesting to me because studies years ago by a Japanese investigator had showed if you infect mice with CMV and it goes into the brain, um, if you slice their brain and put it in tissue culture, the, vi the virus will be reactivated because there's no immune system. And if you have a virus that turns blue, it turns blue in areas that are discrete, specific, and also in the stem cell population of the glial stem cells, which are thought to be the cells that give rise to gliomas, possibly. So our, we started questioning, well, what happens if CMV is in these stem cells throughout life or gets in them in a person, and you lose normal immune function and some kind of mutation occurs, could the virus uh, promote this brain tumor stem cell survival phenotype? And so, um, Dwayne mentioned we had a paper in cancer research a couple of years ago, and it was pretty shocking when we took tumor cells from patients and we grew them in these neurosphere conditions. They would typically grow the spheres. And then if we just knocked out that critical viral gene with a siRNA but not a control siRNA, these spheres would not grow as well. And we saw that that was associated with knocking down not only the viral gene, IE1, which you can see on a Western blot here, but also SOX2, snail and some of these other prototypical cancer stem cell um, proteins that are critical for tumor stem cells. So it suggested that this viral gene here was actually promoting survival of these tumor glioblastoma cells right out of a patient from, you know, that hadn't been infected by an exogenous virus. They were already infected and we knocked out the virus and they essentially shut down in two rounds of uh, further growth. And Duane showed this slide already. Conversely, if we grow our tumors for a long time, they lose the viral infection of CMV, but then if we infect them again with a clinical isolate of CMV, they just go <laughs> like you've added massive growth factors onto them. And that's not what happens with normal astrocytes. If you infect normal astrocytes, they will die. So um, there's something that's happened to these cells, and, um, and I'll show you that um, we've, used, we've begun to use 
Patrick Pattison sells that uh, Patrick was here a little earlier to sort of start to understand what's going on here and why there's a paradoxical effect of infecting normal cells versus tumor cells. Um, this is an old slide I made, but basically I think that the virus drives uh, a growth factor that is on the cell surface. We found that CMV activates PDGFR, and then once the virus gets in the tumors, it expresses these genes, and Duane talked about this one, which can cause cancer in and of itself. Uh, these drive all these downstream pathways. IA1 blocks RB and P53 and drives PI3 kinase. And this net effect, I believe, is to drive all these pathways. Meanwhile, the virus has been shown by Amy Heinberger's lab to, in tumor cells from patients to produce a, a viral immunosuppressive cytokine called viral IL-10 which blocks the immune response to the tumor. So all of these things together basically fulfill all the hallmarks of cancer just from this virus. But as I mentioned, um, is these, these hallmarks don't occur when you infect a normal astrocyte. So this is not something that the cancer, pop, the cancer re research community is willing to accept at face value because, you know, cancers like HP, I mean, viruses like HPV can actually cause cancer uh, because they knock out um, tumor suppressors, but this is something that probably is, a, is only going to promote cancer in a conditional environment. Um, so the things we need to do to figure this out are to sequence the complete genomes of the tumors and see if there's something specific about these viruses. And we've started a project with Tim Kowalik at the University of Massachusetts where we sent him tumors, uh, uh, DNAs, and he's uh, started doing whole genome sequencing of the virus. So these are six tumors, and he's the world's authority in terms of the evolutionary tree of CMV, and he's found that when he can, this, we've only done six, but in his preliminary studies, when he looks at CMV acquired from children, urine or um, saliva, et cetera, the, the six tumors we sent him all um, sort of cluster in one little area that's closest to spinal, to CMV obtained from um, uh, spinal fluid or um, other sources, and then, which which is interesting because the virus seems to uh, have a gene pattern of expression specific to the organ system it goes to. So maybe there are brain tumor specific strains like an HPV and cervical cancer that are promoters of, of glioma. Um, so in trying to figure this out, we've done some experiments, and we need to follow up on this. But we have a colleague who has something called a back. Uh, it's a bacterial artificial chromosome that has all the viral genes in it. So you can dump the, all the genes of the virus into a cell, and it will be as if the cell is infected. But um, then you can follow which genes are expressed later on. And so if you infect uh, glioblastoma uh, stem-like cells with CMV, and these are all the different genes, all 200 viral genes laid out, you see that there are all, many of the viral genes, almost all of them, are, active, are expressed early on. And if you continue passaging these cells long term, most of these are shut off, except there are some that continue to be highly expressed. And these are genes that we think are very important, including I1, which I already mentioned, and these two genes here, which are critical for protein translation. They prevent the cell from shutting down. When we took these long term passage tumor cells and then looked at the the human genes that were expressed, we also found that there were human genes that were expressed that were important in, um, in glioblastoma development as well. Uh, these are some of the more important ones that were induced, showing that the virus activated certain hubs of transcription that are uh, relevant to the biology of the tumor. So what we think is maybe going on in, in real life is that maybe there is sort of a under-the-radar expression pattern of the virus. Um, just like I mentioned in Kaposi's sarcoma or something like that, where the virus is expressing certain genes that are drivers and can promote the biology of the tumor. So in order to figure out which viral genes are present, we're going directly to um, the proteins. But before I mention that, this is a, these are some cells that Patrick Pattison gave us. These are these tumor uh, initiating, these are these, sorry, neural precursor stem cells. And then in this case, he's manipulated them so that they're more like um, cancer cells by knocking out critical pathways involved in P53 and turning on EGFRV3. So these are, uh, 
This is the parent cell. These are the ones that have been turned into tumor-like cells. And when we infected, uh, we haven't published this, but when we infect both of these cells with this BAC that has a, a gene that uh, also expresses a green marker, we, and we persistently keep these infected, we find that um, certain genes in the normal stem cell don't get highly expressed. And this is uh, OLIG2, PROM1, or CD133, and CXCR4. But in the ones that are CMV infected, these genes are dramatically induced. And these are critical genes in terms of the stem cell biology. And so you get more sphere formation in these uh, sort of cancer predisposed cells. So we think that there's a um, something that allows the virus in the in the environment of a cancer cell to do totally different bad things than it would in a normal uh, stem cell. And that may be how it interacts in that environment. And finally, um, the last slide is, uh, in order for us to really understand what's going on, we're going directly to tumor specimens, getting the proteins from the tumors, and hopefully figuring out which proteins are expressed in the tumors. And hopefully this will inform the next generation of immunotherapy for uh, Duane and other colleagues. Um, what we're doing is we've got a lot of antibodies to CMV proteins, um, and we can take a tumor, take the proteins out of the tumor, mix uh, the, mo the monoclonal antibodies to various viral proteins with the tumor, and then pull out all of the proteins from the virus that are in the tumor. We take those and we run them on a shotgun mass spectroscopy, and then we confirm some of the key ones using something called SRM, which is where you're putting in a peptide that is like a positive control, and you can confirm 100% that that's actually the viral protein. And we started doing that. Um, we've got, we've completed about six or seven tumors, and we've got a batch of about 30 or 40 we're going to do soon in collaboration with the Hutch. But our preliminary findings have shown that in, it varies. I think we had five out of seven tumors were positive for CMV proteins. One tumor had about 40 different viral proteins that came down. And of course, the viral proteins are often associated with human cellular proteins. And when we looked at, in one case, the pattern of human cellular proteins that came down, we see that a lot of those cellular proteins are involved in major pathways that have a significant impact on tumor biology, like the Warburg effect, especially things involved in P53 function, uh, things involved in EGFR signaling. Um, so I'm very excited about this project because we're going right to the source, and what I want to do is produce a biomarker proteome, or virome, I guess you could say, of what the virus ha is, ex is producing in these tumors, and hopefully that'll f increase our understanding of the tumor biology, the virus involvement, and allow us to figure out if there are certain proteins that are always expressed that might be good markers for uh, immunotherapy. So I have a lot of people to thank uh, for all of the work that was done, and, um, and I want to thank you all so much for spending the whole day here and uh, listening to these lectures. I really appreciate this, and it's a great forum for us to, to look at various uh, sort of areas of investigation and maybe see uh, areas that can overlap and stimulate discussion and novel research. Thanks again for coming.